Everybody can hear me okay? Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And uh, I appreciate you in attendance today. Uh, so today I'm actually here in company with James Cross. James, can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, Tim. Hey, James. And uh, together we uh, we worked together with Prasath uh, on, on this presentation. Prasath was not able to attend and will be presenting on his behalf. Um, but James and I are really excited to, to share with you um, different ways that we can work together to reduce the carbon emissions in the iron and steel industry, and particularly around steam methane reformers. Um, there's a very specific application which we'll get into around how direct reduced, direct reduced iron production actually includes steam methane reformers. And we can talk, we're going to talk about today about how we can decarbonize uh, the steam methane reformers in this process. Um, so looking forward to, to sharing this insight with you today. Just to give you some general uh, grounds along the way, uh, this the purpose is the, of this specific webinar is to talk directly about how do we safely and effectively decarbonize, decarbonize the combustion process. So we're going to talk a lot about combustion processes specific to the direct reduced iron production process and primarily around its steam methane reformer process. Now, for today's agenda, we're going to talk about global trends that are impacting DR, the DRI space right now and, and driving it towards efforts to decarbonize. Um, we'll also provide a, an overview of the direct reduced iron uh, process and technology in case you're not familiar with it or not as or would like to learn more about it. Um, we'll also talk about optimized combustion, uh, how does it work, and also how do you leverage it to increase safety and reduce emissions. Uh, James will go into thermal imaging uh, of how to safely monitor this, the two ball temperature for safety and, and how and ultimately how these two different uh, Amatech solutions really work together to increase safety and reduce emissions in steam methane reformers. And as Carla mentioned, we you're welcome to uh, to post your your questions in the chat. And Carla, if you see any questions in the chat, feel free to uh, highlight them. And uh, we'll also have time at the end for questions, but feel free to add your comments real time or at the end. We'll have time for both. Now let's get started. So let's talk about some of the global trends. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that everywhere between governments and corporations, there's a lot of there's a lot of policies moving towards reducing carbon emissions just overall in the world to reduce climate change and to reduce greenhouse emissions. And as you put a microscope onto the different industries, um, there is a push to reduce emissions in the steel industry. Uh, of the industrial sector of the industrial space, iron and steel actually represents about 19%. I've even seen some reports that say up to 30% of industrial CO2 emissions. Uh, and these are some of the, the insights generated from the World Economic Forum from 2022. But give you some perspective that, that steel is a big part of the CO2 footprint and also is a big part of the solution to reducing emissions. Now, with that in mind, one, one thing to consider is that According to the IEA for uh, industrial, the uh, International Environmental Agency, the iron and steel subsector is actually not on track. And as, as we quote them, the CO2 emission intensity of steel has seen a mixed picture in recent years, but needs to drop significantly to align with the net zero scenario for 2020 for 2050. So all these things considered, there is a, a need to Put the steel industry back on track, and, and we'll, we'll talk about ways to do that and ways uh, to keep in mind. But there is one thing, uh, there, there are a number of studies going on right now. One of the studies mentioned that uh, direct reduced iron, in addition to electric iron furnace technology, both currently available, um, as you can see in this McKinsey study, together there, there are carbon lean technologically available path right now to decarbonize. And uh, if you look at just the DRI space, this this solution compared to blast furnace efficiency and this this process of using direct reduced iron in addition to electric iron furnaces actually reduces about 33%, about a third of the CO2 emissions compared to blast furnace and, and basic oxygen furnace um, route because you're you're using a higher hydrogen content source from natural gas compared to coal as a reducing agent. So just that by itself, uh, getting the steel industry back on track with reducing emissions, this is one way to uh, to consider 
and it, it's why we want to bring some attention to the direct reduced iron space. So ultimately, uh, as the World Economic Forum states, there's there's no net zero by 2050 without industries. And as we proposed, as McKinsey showed, and as we proposed, the direct reduced iron and electric iron furnace path offers one ready ready made approach to decarbonize. Now, just to provide an overview of direct reduced iron, in case you're not familiar with it or you'd like some more information on it, uh, direct reduced iron is actually a high quality iron product that's used as a feedstock for electric iron furnaces, blast furnaces, and other iron and steel making applications. So it's a feedstock, and uh, that feedstock comes in many different commercially available uh, packets, if you will. You can you can buy it in lumps, as you can see here. You can also buy it as pellets or also as briquettes, and they can be hot or they can be cold, and that, that actually impacts efficiency as well. If you look at the DRI pellets and the DRI lumps, those are categorized as hot or cold. The hot, if you charge them into a electric arc furnace at high temperatures because they're hot, um, that reduce that that actually offers a significant energy savings because you don't have to provide any extra elect electricity, any other electric, uh, any additional uh, energy to heat the hot direct reduced iron. So it's one path to just already reduce energy from your fuel source, from your feed source. In addition to that, hot briquetting also um, adding these little these are also produced from vertical shaft kilns and compressed into what you can see here is like these little pellet briquettes, these little pillow sized briquettes, which are safer to handle and also safer to ship and easier to ship uh, for process. There's just something to consider because uh, that is just what direct reduced iron is as a feed source to, to the steel industry. Uh, now I'll pass it over to James just to talk a little bit more of the production processes around DRI. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Um, there's, there's two main paths to produce DRI. It's relatively dynamic, I'd say, at the moment. There's quite a lot of innovation and there's a lot of discussion around increasing the efficiency even more. As Tim mentioned, we're really for today's webinar talking about fired heaters and steam methane reformers. So I just wanted to define where we're really focusing for today, but in the broader context. So in gas-based DRI, where steam methane reformers are deployed, the iron oxide is reduced in the presence of reducing gases, whereas in coal-based DRI production, rotary hearths, uh, rotary kilns and rotary hearth furnaces use lump ore and are reacted directly with coal. So there's no external reducing gas required, therefore no need for gasification or no need for uh, steam methane reformers. That method, pretty dominant in some countries and, and India in particular, is notably less environmentally friendly, so a higher CO2 intensity. And there's a, there's a few articles and a few reports about limited product quality that you can achieve due to the high levels of ash and sulfur when you're um, directly processing the lump ore uh, in, in such a furnace. So if we look on the left hand side, you can see that the reduction unit itself receives either coal or the prepared process gas and the type of products that you're receiving really depends on the demand in the local um, economy or, or the export economy. So the breakdown globally is pretty, pretty stable, but like I said, there are a lot of new projects coming online and there's a lot of discussions around uh, optimization of these process. But the reason we're talking about SMRs now is that there are a lot of new SMRs coming online in the next five to seven years. And the majority of current global DRI production does use gas technology. Around 25% is estimated uh, if you use the Midrex technologies um, data from the end of 2021. Um, Midrex obviously isn't the only um, technology provider. There's an energy ion process as well, um, which is a, a technology produced by Daniele and Tanova that accounts for a really significant market share. Um, the 
Midrex process itself is highlighted here and you can see the role of the steam methane reformer in the middle of that process. But there are other fired heaters in that uh, diagram that some of the technology we're talking about have relevance to as well. Probably the shaft furnace as well. We don't tend to focus on that right now because it hasn't been a, a, a hugely um, problematic area, I would say. But as, as time goes on, we probably expect to see some uh, temperature and combustion related inquiries on that. So we're really focusing on that central piece, the steam methane reformer and how that process gas, which is later enriched uh, with natural gas, oxygen, hydrogen, um, and how we can optimise the efficiency of that SMR. I don't talk so much about the energizing process. There's a there's a zero reforming energizing process and a process that does use a, an SMR. Generally speaking, we break the types of SMRs used in DRI production into two parts, although there are more. Um, terrace fired is a terrace wall fired reformer typically with a single lane of tubes and burners which fire from the bottom vertically up the wall and supply that wall with radiant heat, which is uh, emitted onto the tubes, heating the tubes, where the steam and natural gas are passed over a catalyst. The reaction between that steam and natural gas produces our syngas, made up primarily of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. In DRI production, there's also bottom fired furnaces or steam methane reformers, which typically deployed by Midrex. That produces a few challenges because there's typically more than one row. So multi-lane layouts with huge numbers of tubes, which need to be balanced, which need to be, need to be optimized. So that's where the opportunity lies for instrumentation manufacturers, such as Amatec, to assist with the optimization and monitoring from a safety perspective. Um, Tim will lead us forward and I'll come back uh, later on uh, tube wall temperature monitoring. Thank you, James. And so when we when we think about combustion efficiency and safety, uh, really there's two principles that we'd like to share with you today, uh, specific to, to just that, especially when we think about the steam methane reformer, how can we make that even more uh, efficient and, and, and safe? So the first principle, which we'll talk about in just a moment, is uh, and then the second principle we'll talk about is the tube ball temperature monitoring. And uh, just getting us started off, I'll talk about combustion optimization, and we'll, we'll pivot over to tube ball temperature monitoring right after that. So for combustion optimization, uh, combustion by itself, if, if you don't already know, requires three things. It requires oxygen to heat. Now, in any combustion process, there's going to be a little bit of incomplete combustion in the form of what we call combustibles or some amount of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Now, the, this incomplete combustion can be caused from a lot of things, uh, such as poor mixing or um, variable fuels or changing fuels or even a malfunctioning burner. And so it's always important to think about, OK, well, what what about a, what amount of combustibles are being generated? to make sure that we're in a safe window and that we're also producing uh, an effective combustion process. So I'll go into a little bit further, but just as a heads up, one thing that I like to look at, one, one thing I like to consider is what are the relevant combustion measurements to think about? So we'll talk about excess oxygen as a set point to monitor, to monitor the air to fuel ratio and for process integrity. Uh, for combustibles, we'll talk about how that impacts safety and also burner optimization. Then there's other uh, opportunities for combustion measurements to think about with um, the actual fuel itself, methane, hydrocarbons, even hydrogen as a, as a fuel source to monitor for safety. What if you had a, a tube leak, for example, or a gas uh, flame out or, or a flame out? And then ultimately, if you have any type of combustion measurement, you want to make sure that the sample that you're reading is representative of the process. So how do you ensure that? So just as a quick overview, these are this is just a, a working overview of what is combustion and also what are some combustion measurements to consider. Now, if you actually look at the combustion process and take a, a furnace, for example, the, the perfect air to fuel ratio, the, the perfect air to fuel mixture, where you have the exact amount of 
methane needed or natural gas or, or fuel with the exact amount of oxygen needed to produce the maximum efficiency. This is what we call stoichiometric combustion. And stoichiometric combustion is exactly that. You consume all of the oxygen exactly to produce exact amount of carbon dioxide and water. And as a result, you have maximum efficiency, maximum heat transfer, least amount of heat loss, and you produce just CO2, water, and, and whatever nitrogen from the atmosphere passes through. Now, this is perfect conditions. Um, in reality, uh, and notice that there's no excess of oxygen in these conditions because you consume all the oxygen exactly. So there's none left over. Now, in 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 practice, heaters and steam methane reformers, these these types of fired heaters and fired equipment uh, typically operates at an excess of oxygen in the flue gas and an excess of air at the burner. And as a result, you're slightly less efficient because you're you're burning more inerts, the oxygen is passing through. So you're a little bit less efficient, requires a little bit more, a little bit more fuel. But as a result, you're in a safe operating window. And sure, you generate a little bit of combustibles, low amounts of combustibles, but it's still within a um, a useful heat transfer and um, a safe operating condition, if you will. So safe operating margin. This is operating with excess air or excess oxygen uh, for, for the process. Now, notice that there's a slight excess of oxygen, and that oxygen is a safety margin. Because <clears throat> if you don't have enough oxygen, you run the risk of uh, what we call a fuel rich condition or an oxygen deficient uh, condition. In this case, you have an excess of fuel, not enough air. So what happens is you consume all of the methane, you consume all of the fuel, but you only partially oxidize it. You consume all of the oxygen, but you only partially oxidize it. And as a result, you generate CO2, you generate water, but you actually have very high levels of incomplete combustion in the form of very high combustibles. And this is a useful amount of this is this is unburnt fuel effectively. This is unburnt combustion process, and as a result, it's it's actually 35% less efficient uh, compared to the stoichiometric case. So not only is it unsafe, posting posting a very fuel-rich safety hazard condition, you're also less efficient. And so the question is, well, how do you decide what's the right operating condition? And as you can see, there's no excess of oxygen in the fuel-rich conditions. You consumed all of the oxygen and generated very high, extremely high combustibles of incomplete combustion. Now, if you want to think about the safety margin, one thing I propose to you is actually looking at the excess oxygen in the flue gas or the stack or the exhaust gas, the excess oxygen at the exhaust of the furnace compared to the excess air at the burner. And what happens is if you map it, and I actually did these calculations, it's actually a graph that I generated, what you actually see is if you choose a number of percent excess oxygen in the fuel, so if you monitor the, the excess oxygen and monitor to about 3%, uh, that actually translates directly to about a 20% excess air at the burner. So you're putting in 20% excess of air at the burner more than what's needed to provide a safety margin above stoichiometric conditions. Now, if you take two percent excess oxygen flue gas, a slightly lower, it's actually uh, about a 12 percent excess air at the burner. So it, there's still a safety margin, just less as you can see. But if you really look at those between two and three percent, you as a typical operating range for natural gas. Now this will increase significantly if you use coal or oil. But if you look at natural gas in this case, these these translate directly to about a 12 to 20 percent excess air at the burn. So there's always some amount of some amount of safety margin, and that's that's how these this excess oxygen measurement translates directly to the excess air at the burner. So in the case as I mentioned, with normal operation being around 20 percent excess air, so if you operate with an excess additional 20 percent more air, it actually results in an excess of about 3 percent oxygen 
and the flue gas. So again, it's a safer condition. You will see some low levels of P PPM levels of combustibles. It's a little bit less efficient, but it's a safer version. And you know that you have that 20% safety margin of, of air at the burner. So um, that's just something to consider when it comes to operation. Now, we just talked about this, but about a typical operating set point for natural gas on a, on a burner is about 2%. Uh, excess oxygen in the flue gas. And that actually represents some amount of CO2 in lung emissions. And what happens is as you increase your excess oxygen, as you put more and more air at, to the burner, driving more and more air out, that oxygen out the, the back of the process and stack, you actually generate a higher amount of CO2 and NOx emissions because you're putting more inerts into the system because the oxygen just passes through, the excess of oxygen passes through, and that requires fuel to burn it. So that higher fuel consumption contributes to the higher CO2, the higher NOx emissions because there's more oxygen available to, to react with NOx. And that trend actually increases further if you increase to higher excess oxygen levels. So higher, much higher CO2 and NOx emissions if you have a higher uh, excess oxygen level. So and Tim, we've got I'll, a question. Sure. Um, what increase in, in NOx will you see with maintaining a 2 to 3 percent excess air in exhaust that corresponds to 12 to 20 percent excess air at the burn? Uh, that is a great question. I actually do not have that in this particular slide. Um, I do have a couple other webinars on. Um, I can I can actually probably create a future webinar to discuss that. Uh, I can't say the specific amount, but it, it does increase from like maybe, for example, like maybe, maybe it really it really depends on the process actually. Uh, but there is an increase, and it's actually as as you increase the amount of oxygen, you increase the amount of norms. Um, but I don't have those numbers offhand. But that is a great question. I can I can certainly include that in a future. Uh, are low NOx burners used in these situations to counter operating at the higher excess um, oxygen levels? They they can be, but they still have to. Low NOx, the thing about low NOx burners is you really have to operate within a specific window. And so it, it's certainly an option. Uh, they're the same physics still apply when it comes to the actual amount of. NOx generated. You're still going to have more NOx if there's more air available. Uh, NOx, low NOx burners, they they stage out the air. So there's less point for creating a, a hot spot for high temperatures, but it doesn't necessarily. Uh, but the same principles apply. If, if you were still if you're still able to lower the NOx, if you were still able to lower the amount of oxygen present, you would still lower the amount of NOx produced. Even with the low NOx burner and staged air, same physics supply. But that's a, that's a great question. Okay. So if we just continue forward on on this specific um, graph, this 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 line, as we mentioned, excess oxygen over time, our excess oxygen increasing amounts in the flue gas, uh, that actually represents a safety margin, but also some amount of efficiency losses because of operating it higher excess air, because again, you're heating that, that flue gas, those inerts that pass through. Um, as I said, that, that relates to a higher emission, higher fuel consumption, and ultimately higher CO2 NOx emissions and fuel consumptions, uh, proportionately. proportionally. Uh, to the question about how much more, it really depends on the process, the burner. <laughs> There's a lot of factors involved uh, in, in how much NOx is produced. Uh, but all those things considered, those I would propose to you to be the excess air losses uh, generated by operating too high of excess oxygen. You still need some excess oxygen for safety margin. As you increase it, it, it can it certainly increases. Now, when you look at the combustibles measurement, I mean, we haven't talked very much about combustibles, uh, but when you look at combustibles, as you increase excess oxygen, you have more oxygen available to react with the fuel to fully oxidize the carbon monoxide and hydrogen present. And the, the amount of combustibles decreases over time, or decreases with the amount of excess oxygen you have available to furnace. 
However, as you reduce the excess oxygen, you actually get closer and closer to what we call a combustible breakthrough point. And that combustible breakthrough point, after some point, close, getting closer to stoichiometric conditions, you actually have an you actually have an exponential, you know, astronomical increase in the amount of combustibles present. And uh, this is seen across different uh, combustion processes. And really, you don't want to go past the combustible breakthrough point because this becomes a fuel-rich condition and becomes a safety concern. So there's really a balance. Uh, with the 2% oct operating set point, you have a safety margin, but you're operating with some inefficiencies and increasing amounts of CO2 and NOx emissions. As you get closer to about 1%, you have what we would propose to be an optimum control point, where you're balancing the safety margin away from combustibles breakthrough, but you're also not too high, where you're uh, just passing excess air through the through the furnace and uh, heating air. So, uh, in excess in excessive amounts that generate un unnecessary fuel consumption. So this is what we call this this optimum control point is what we call combustion optimization where you uh, intentionally reduce fuel emissions, fuel consumption and NOx emissions by reducing the excess oxygen to this specific range for safe operation. So if you measure excess oxygen by itself, with say an in-situ circulating oxide analyzer or something like that, it provides you an operating set point. But when you look at additional measurements such as uh, monitor measuring combustibles, you can monitor for these efficient losses from combustibles. So you can reduce your fuel consumption from excess oxygen, reduce your emissions, and also avoid the unsafe conditions around high like combustibles, combustibles breakthrough. So uh, that's what we talked about. How do you reduce emissions from the steam methane reformer? That's where combustion optimization comes right in as one option. And as I said, as you reduce excess oxygen, you increase combustibles. So where is that point right in the middle for safe operation? Now, uh, the the Amatech advantage, if you will, the, or the the uh, Amatech process instrument product that that we represent is a Thermox WG5 combustion analyzer. Uh, the, the Thermox WG5 actually offers the ability to measure excess oxygen, combustibles, CO2, and hydrogen, and hydrocarbons. And I should add, it also measures hydrogen if you have some amount of hydrogen in the fuel gas, or if you use it if you use hydrogen as a fuel. So we can measure that at, at a percent level. If it were to have a flame out event, uh, we could we could detect that. Uh, but ultimately, the as you think about decarbonizing steam methane reformer safely, uh, the W5 contributes to combustion optimization to ensure fuel efficiency and reduced emissions. Uh, having these additional measurements for safety monitoring to monitor for incomplete combustion or a fuel leak. Uh, and it has inherently the design with redundancies and diagnostics for SIL2 safety systems. Uh, so that's something that we can measure excess oxygen with for SIL2 safety systems and also combustibles for SIL2 safety systems. And really, uh, it actually mounts to the process flange in what we call a close coupled to extractive design for faster responses. And so um, in Amatech process instruments perspective, this is uh, the Thermox uh, WG5 as a solution to decarbonize these steam methane reformer processes, uh, combustion processes, safely and efficiently. So uh, that's just a quick overview of the Thermox WG5. Um, that being said, now let's talk about tube ball temperature. And we, we talked just about the steam methane reformer for direct reduced iron production overall. And you now we focus specifically on steam methane reformer. Now, one thing I want to propose to you is after you after you monitor for combustion optimization, reduce your excess oxygen, increase your combustibles, something happens. Now, because you're reducing your excess oxygen, you have less inerts going through. You have less safety margin at the burner, but you also have less inerts going through the, the combustion process that need to be heated, um, which actually increases temperature. So if you reduce your excess oxygen, causing you to increase your com combustibles measurement. But because you're removing those inerts, you're actually increasing your tube ball temperature quite significantly. And that's where tube ball temperature becomes important because you don't want to create a hot spot on the tubes 
that could be the, become a potential leak. And so with that, I'll pass it on to uh, James to talk about two ball temperature monitoring from a, from an Amtec land perspective. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for connecting the dots as well between the combustion optimization and analysis and tube wall temperature monitoring. Um, th there's a few questions come in about the the analyzers themselves. As um, Carla said, I think we'll address those at the end because they're related to um, a couple of points um, that we'll discuss in the wrap up. So as as Tim said, when we run these SMRs richer, essentially lower oxygen set points, we run the risk of elevated tube wall temperatures. And in my experience, at least, reducing gas steam methane reformers or the ones that we'll typically use to produce the type of gas required for a shaft furnace, they're run at lower pressures but higher temperatures. So you're running quite close often to tube wall temperature limits um, already. So you really don't have the type of window that you might have on other types of SMR plant. For example, in the ammonia industry, we have higher pressures, but lower temperatures, uh, hydrogen produced for refinery, uh, lower temperatures and lower pressures. So we need to really make sure that we're accurate with the temperatures, especially if we're running at lower oxygen set points. So proper data correction and proper temperature accuracy is important. If we're inaccurately high, i.e. if I go out and take a measurement and assume that I'm running at 1950F um, or let, let's say 950C, but really I'm running at 850C or 1850F, the risk is not so much on the safety side. There's no there's no critical emergency, but we'll probably have a high methane slip, which we don't want in DRI production. We don't want a lot of methane from the process gas going into the shaft furnace. We don't want to lose margin. Uh, we don't want to be wasting energy uh, firing the furnace and producing less um, syngas. And we don't want to spend a lot of our time chasing false alarm, chasing, chasing ghosts, as one of one of my customers put it. On the flip side, if you're inac inaccurately low, if you're measuring, um, for example, 750C, but really you're running at 850C, or even worse, if you're over your design temperatures, you can see that that type of error, just 100 degrees F error, which we see, which is realistic if you're not correcting temperatures properly, the lifetime of the tubes really shortens quickly and we can start to have issues with safety, um, with, with reliability and ultimately with the uh, operations of the plant. We, we've done um, a couple of uh, case studies with customers whereby we analyze the maximum uh, tube metal temperatures in a steam methane reformer and where those excursions existed that you can see highlighted in red in that table the cost to replace the tubes had they failed would have been in the 300 to 400 thousand dollar price range and the cost of replacing those tubes is an additional eighty thousand dollars so by making some small investments in improving the accuracy of measurements and the equipment needed to do that, um, this, this particular end user could offset those costs. Um, again, cross-referencing some research from adjacent industries, the ammonia industry, or one of the um, research groups called Ammonia Know-How, um, informed us that 22% of equipment failures in that entire industry involved the primary syngas reformer. And more than half of those failures involved tube wall temperature, temperature excursions. Now, when you dig into that data, a lot of those did occur during startup or during um, cutouts or during uh, upsets. So it's not so much uh, always about the accuracy on a continuous basis. It's also being able to cope with 
upsets to the process that might cause some question marks over measurements um, and particularly when um, thing, things are changing or equipment is being started up. If you do get that right you can obviously have a, a big increase in production while still operating in a in a in a safe window. So just talking about a couple of tube failure mechanisms again there's there's not a huge number of uh, SMRs used in DRI production compared to the number of um, SMRs used in ammonia and methanol in hydrogen production. Um, but we do see carbon formation more in DRI processes, again, because of those higher temperatures um, than, than you do in other areas. And I've also got a feeling that that's caused by some of the knowledge gaps that exist in the steel industry operating what is essentially a chemical plant versus a refinery which has been operating this type of plant for 50 or 60 years. So one of those reasons is a low steam to carbon ratio, i.e. your process gas is rich. You could have heavy hydrocarbons in feedstocks, not uncommon um, when you're working on, a, on an integrated steel plant. Uh, the catalyst activity can drop, which causes the inside tube wall and process gas temperature to increase. Then we get the carbon formation rate exceeding the gasification rate. So you get a layer of graphite on the inside of that tube wall, reduction in heat transfer between the, uh, the flue gas and the process gas and a runaway reaction. That could be caused by initial issues with the catalyst or loading of the catalyst. We could have insufficient purging of the residual hydrocarbons prior to restart. Again, something which can cause very rapid increases in temperature, which are hard to manage uh, once it's started or you could have a complete or intermittent loss of steam, similar to that low steam to carbon ratio, which causes uh, issues with carbon formation. Hey, James, um, we've got a, a quick question. Um, what are the typical environmental consequences of tube failures in terms of emissions? Or will you be addressing that? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. In, I know just another question on, um, on SO2, probably not a not a big impact on SO2. A lot of the a lot of the DRI processes and, and general SMR processes have have sulfur removal upstream of the of the SMR. So there shouldn't be a, a high uh, sulfur content in the incoming natural gas. Um, I mean generally you're you're talking about adding a huge a huge amount of methane to the flue gas that otherwise wouldn't have been or shouldn't have been there. If you do have a tube leak, um, if you end up having to nip that tube or multiple tubes, then obviously you still need to produce the same amount of syngas. So you're going to have to fire that reformer harder. So that's another environmental impact in that you need you need the same amount of production, but you're going to now do it with uh, with fewer tubes. So you're going to have to run um probably on average a little bit a little bit hotter than than you would have and definitely definitely with uh, with less balance um another another question there i see whilst i've got the chat open on bottom fired reformers correct this one is a top fired reformer um i was going to flip the image and see if anybody noticed but um you, you would have probably spotted that alexander so the um yeah you're right a lot of the images i do have are from adjacent industries like i said there's not a huge number of um DRI SMRs in comparison. We do have some um, from Midrex performers, which which I'm not able to share, um, but which I can I, I can probably share with uh, with some permission um, offline. So um, that carbon formation you can see probably causing those those glowing hot bands on that um, on that image uh, because that was cleared up by uh, by steaming of those tubes. That, that does reduce that in, inside tube wall heat transfer coefficient. The interpellate heat transfer coefficient is affected. You haven't got that radiant effect from the hot hot catalyst. So you do get that um, you do get that type of uh, runaway reaction. And then you have reduced catalyst activity as the active nickel sites are covered by carbon. So what starts with a small issue can end up being quite a significant uh, problem for the process. Um, I'll address an, I'll, I'll address a, a couple of the other questions um, at the end. Um, so fuel inefficiency, when a, when a tube does overheat, one of the unfortunate consequences is that there's no, what is essentially cooling gas flowing through that tube. 
So that now hot tube will radiate onto other tubes so you can have multiple tubes overheating. And then to counter that, producers reduce firing around these tubes, but increase the general level of firing to keep up the production, reduce the methane slip on other tubes. So you can have an overall uh, efficiency uh, reduction and higher risks because other tubes are running hotter. To remove the carbon formed on the interior of the tubes, uh, producers can steam those tubes. That gasification process, as I hinted at earlier, so just gasifying that carbon that's produced on that tube does, does produce significant volumes of CO2, as we know from the ethylene and, uh, and other associated industries. Um, so therefore, reducing the severity of coking and hot bands can have a good general impact on your efficiency. So how do we do that? We, we measure temperatures with the Cyclops, that's the single point pyrometer. Often operators go around with a laptop or with a notepad or with a Bluetooth device connected to their, to their device and just record tube by tube, row by row, what the temperatures are and then they're reported back into a spreadsheet. Those temperatures can be analysed over time um, and, and often are to, to great effect, but that's just on a single plane. So we're not looking necessarily for the hottest point. We're just looking for the temperature across a single plane and then comparing that day one, day two, day three and seeing what patterns um, start to emerge. One, one of the things that we do know on the syngas reformers is the impact of opening the peep door. So in these cases, the impact of opening the peep door is relatively minimal. So you can have reductions of five, six degrees C over 200 seconds, but we've also seen examples of 40 degrees C reductions when you open the peak door and 45 minute re recoveries. That's one of the limitations of having a peak door on a furnace with a, with a negative pressure. A lot of the cold air is gonna be pulled in and you're measuring conditions that don't fully represent the furnace conditions during operation. So to counter that, we like to know what the peak door cooling effect is. And you can do that with a simple study, take a measurement every 10 seconds after opening a peak door, and then plot that curve to see what the cooling and the uh, recovery time is um, with the peak door left open. So that's a valuable thing we can do. The other valuable thing we can do in terms of reference measurements is use a gold cup. The gold cup is a reference pyrometer used to uh, calibrate if you like, in situ, the other methods that we use. So you cannot hold a three metre long or nine foot long water cooled probe onto every single tube. But we can take reference measurements on multiple tubes and then use the correction values that we've determined to implement those emissivity correction factors, our background correction factors uh, into our thermal imaging and pyrometry instrumentation. Therefore, we've got accurate accurate values across the board. Thermal imaging technology, one thing we're asked more and more about um, on all types of SMR, and probably more in the steel industry because of the prevalence of thermal imaging and high temperature instrumentation on other processes, because thermal imaging is used on EAF furnaces, it's used for slag detection, it's used for product measurement. Um, so it's something that the steel industry is probably more familiar with than, than other industries. Just, just a couple of um, points on the range of cameras. NIR in this case refers to near infrared, so that's working in the short wavelength. That's really good for um, applications with clean fuels, so high hydrogen contents, high methane contents, you're not going to have many CO2 or water vapour molecules interfering with our um, with our site path. So one micron thermal image or parameter is really good most of the time in a clean atmosphere. Where there's rich burners or heavy soot particles or wideband radiation, uh, you may need, in some cases, an MWIR, which stands for mid-wave infrared. That's operating in the um, 3.9 micron range. Minor uh, point to note is that the higher wavelengths typically deal with lower temperatures. So lower wavelengths typically deal with higher temperatures. 
that's great in terms of increasing the accuracy as temperature temperatures rise. However, what it also does, where we have a hot background, like we do in the case of a steam methane reformer, it also makes the lower wavelengths more sensitive to hot background temperatures. So we can have increased errors due to background um, uh, uh, errors uh, at, at lower wavelengths. So it's something we need to consider because in some cases where there's a high delta between the background temperature and the tube wall temperature, we may choose to use a mid-wave infrared boroscope. So jackets or housings, these cameras, all, all three of those cameras can be used with either a fixed housing, which is compatible with the uh, image processing software, or a portable housing and accessory kit, which is compatible with the same software. So the camera itself, the boroscope itself, is the same across the board. And then there's a selection of housings that you can use with those cameras, depending on the type of reformer and the type of application. So the, the type of thing that we can detect, if you look on the right hand side where we have regions of interest on these um, on these tubes on a terraced wall furnace, you can see that cold, in, in, cold air ingress around those tube seals is sucking in a lot of air, causing those tubes to run very cold and causing the area around those tubes to be, you know, really within the five, six hundred, even four hundred degrees C range. So we can really spot issues like that looking for just through peep doors with a with a portable kit. We can also balance the reformer if it's a multi row uh, reformer with a with a significant number of tubes in in those rows. We can balance the temperatures, reducing the spread between the hottest temperature tube and the coldest temperature tube and making sure that we're not over temperature with some tubes or under temperature with others. And then on the right side, you can see what we can do with a vertical gradient. So that's across a single tube. We can compare those tubes and we can see if there's any hot spots down those tubes and start to investigate where the hottest point on each of the tubes in the furnace is. So that's something you could really only do with thermal imaging versus single point or reference parametry. Thermal imaging opens this door to take hundreds of thousands, if not millions of temperature measurements per scene or per video. And we can start to use that, that data to, to optimize uh, our reformers. Fixed solutions. So we can not only install those um, cameras into transportable or portable solutions, we can put these cameras mounted to the side of the furnace to continuously measure temperatures and to continuously collect uh, data and images from that furnace. The problem with top fired furnaces, especially big ones, is that you need a lot of cameras to cover the entire reformer. So what we typically do is say, what's the percentage of coverage of the reformer that you would like? Is it 10%? Is it 50%? Is it 70%? And then we plan a strategy to cover those um, tubes with the specified number of cameras available. And installation locations may be in the 20 to 30, but the number of cameras may be in the four or six. So it's not necessarily a case of having to have, in this case, 15, 16 cameras. You can have 32 locations, but move those cameras around depending on how the furnace uh, is behaving. The side or terrace wall uh, Fired furnaces are typically easier to cover with a uh, with a with fewer cameras because of the single lane layout. We can typically use the end walls where the peep doors are located, just a meter to the side or above, and angle those cameras according to the end user's concern. So where where is the uh, hottest uh, part of the tubes and how do we position those cameras and angle those cameras to cover the to, to cover the the most tubes possible? A few things we can do. Uh, if you see in the top left hand side, we can use multiple different types of region of interest to isolate uh, areas of the furnace to use those background correction values to correct our real time measurements. On the bottom right hand side, you can see that we can use variable emissivities, background temperatures, and reference values 
as our continuous correction. We've got a whole range of uh, adjustable palettes which really help isolate specific temperatures. And then we have thermocouples in the tip of the boroscope so that we know what the temperature is right where the lens is. And then we've got a, a thermistor in the electronics to make sure that the electronics is um, sufficiently cooled or heated. So um, I'll come on to questions very shortly because I'm running out of time. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few benefits of the high definition thermal imaging. On the top image, you can see the standard definition of 300K pixels. You can see a quite pixelated image once we're at the 500% zoom. The max temperature in that range is 919 degrees C. Now the max temperature on the high definition image, and you can see the improved clarity, is 950 degrees C. That's not saying that one is more accurate than the other. What it's saying is, is that the increased pixel resolution means that the area covered by the high definition camera is smaller. So it can find and locate and pinpoint very hot uh, pixels or very small hot areas on that tube. And it will measure that as a hotspot probably sooner than the standard definition camera would. So there's advantages, not just in clarity, but in um, in temperature uh, resolution. The same on burners. You can see on the high definition image on the bottom, the max temperature measured from the burners is 1090, whereas on the standard definition camera, we have uh, 1052. Purely because of the increased resolution, we get better, um, smaller areas covered uh, with, the, uh, with each pixel. And you can see what we can do if we rotate the uh, camera slightly, we can cover an entire tube uh, with a single camera and we can start to look at isotherms to analyze flame behavior, flame impingement and the direction of flue gases as they travel through the reformer. Um, software automation is a big potential um, future advancement. We have a, a package called advanced furnace monitoring. What we really need to do in the long term is deploy um, artificial intelligence and pattern recognition algorithms to really spot these um, furnish issue, issue, issues before they become uh, visible to the naked eye or detectable by basic alarms. So that's what we're we're working on going forward. Tim, I'll let you finish off. Sorry for running over slightly. Um, I'll I'll summarise my slides after yours and have a look at the questions now. No, uh, no problem, James. Those are really interesting to see. Really good to to see how. Um, the resolution really makes a difference among all, many other things. So thanks for sharing. No problem. Um, now, from a Amatech solution perspective, you know, how can we help? And so as I mentioned earlier, the, the Thermox WG5, um, the Thermox WG5 enables you to um, monitor those excess oxygen, combustible, and hydrocarbon measurements. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the Thermox WG5 mounts directly to the process flange with Many different versatile uh, configurations for for mounting it, mounting it on the process, and as a result, the the advantage really comes through the combustion optimization to reduce fuel consumption, to reduce uh, carbon emissions, and uh, the benefit really is is also to support those safety systems, those burner management systems, the BMS systems, um, the safety systems designed for uh, for SIL two, and and we can we've designed it so much with um, redundancies and diagnostics to support those types of safety systems. Now, as far as the uh, boroscope, James, if you could highlight some of those. Yeah, sure, Tim. I, I, I talked about uh, a lot of the features in both the NIRB and the MWIRB, um, and I want to spare a minute to answer a question. So I'll let you wrap up, Tim, and then I'll, um, I'll answer one of the questions. That's 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 including the Gold Cup. So I, I I talked about the Gold Cup and some of the kind of challenges with that, um, with it being a water cooled three meter long probe. We're not saying it's a uh, it's a kind of automatic solution to all all the temperature problems, but it does provide a really accurate uh, reference point. Thank you, James. And so really. Um... One other thing that I think is important is also what else uh, LAN can do to support these applications. So if you wanted to just really quick talk about some of the lines getting off. off uh, yeah, of course. Through. So you can you can see on the uh, left hand side, I just wanted to you know, pay quick attention to some of the other applications that we've studied. So rotary kiln 
monitoring is a really interesting new application that we've uh, started to pay some attention to. And then we also have applications around uh, hot DRI uh, and conveyor belt monitoring using the same type of thermal imaging technologies, just without a boroscope. And then on the gasifier side as well, where, where you see a lot of um, applications, especially in India for coal gasification to produce the syngas, um, we can also point cameras at the outside of the, of the gasifier. So I just wanted to point out DRI is a kind of emerging area that we're not only focused on the SMR, we're also focused on anything that emits the temperature. Yeah, that's definitely an important to highlight. Thanks for thanks for highlighting that, James. And yeah, this is obviously we, we, this is a that it, you know we discussed a lot about the steam methane reformer with indirect reduced iron production. Uh, these are certainly some other applications to consider, um, just that you can consider for, from a land perspective. Um, so just some takeaways to to think about uh, as we think about reducing carbon emissions, CO2 emissions for steam methane reformers. Um, I, I like to think about it from from the inside and out. And so really when it comes to the outside, the, the fired heater perspective, there's the efficiency and the safety perspective. There's the efficiency when it comes to combustion optimization, lowering the excess oxygen level uh, to reduce fuel consumption, reduce carbon emissions, and ultimately maximize the optimal, uh, to identify and optimize the, the ideal air to fuel ratio at the burner. And so in, a, in addition to the efficiency gained, and the reduced emissions gained from combustion optimization. There's also the added benefits of uh, monitoring for incomplete combustion through the combustible measurement, monitoring for fuel rich conditions through the combustibles measurement, and also the hydrocarbon measurement, and also monitoring for loss of flame and fuel leaks through the hydrocarbon measurement. So, um, certainly something to consider there. And then, James, I don't know if you want to speak just briefly on the efficiency and safety perspective of uh, the performing process itself. Yeah, of course. I, I think some of some of the concerns on the DRI side are slightly different to uh, refinery or petro, petrochemical plant. Um, like I said, because DRI plants are running at hotter temperatures, we've seen issues with with tube lifetime. So I think a key issue from the efficiency side is keeping the reformer running, keeping it up at all times, and optimizing those tube lifetimes so that you're getting that you know six, seven, eight year tube lifetime as opposed to having to shut down to replace tubes every every three to four years, and then reducing that methane slip, and then monitoring the uh, temperatures that impacts the heat transfer. And I think from the, from a safety side, a lot of them follow on from that. If we can monitor the fuel leaks, any methane uh, leaking into the furnace atmosphere, uh, we're likely to be able to control that oxygen set point in the furnace um, and increase the overall uh, efficiency of the process. Thanks for the highlights. And then really when it comes down to uh, just some takeaways, as I mentioned, the global iron and steel industry is 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 currently does not appear to be on track of, according to the IEA uh, organization uh, for net zero 20, 2050. But that being said, um, steam methane reformer based direct reduced iron technologies will become increasingly more important for producing these uh, carbon emissions. And then to further reduce the emissions from the steam methane reformer Combustion optimization again offers that ability to lower the oxygen concentration to reduce fuel and CO2 emissions while monitoring for safety. Uh, also, accurate temperature measurement and thermal imaging for two bowl temperatures ensures that there are no hot spots or potential rupture points. Uh, that's also ensuring uptime and safety. And then, really, part of why Amitech Process Instruments and Amitech Land come together to talk about this is really the combined understanding of, of gas analysis and two bowl temperature data can really provide the opportunity to improve balance, you know, to balance the, the heaters, the, the reformers, to increase efficiency and overall combustion safety. Anything else you want to add to that, James, before we get into questions? No, I, I was just trying to look at a couple of questions. I think there's some really good questions coming in, sh showing, I think, the the increase in, uh, in interest in this. So don't, sure. don't have a huge amount to add to that. I think uh, you've covered everything. All right, well, let's uh, let's move on to questions then. Uh, Carl, I know we have a number in the chat, and. Uh, James, I don't know if you want to pick off any questions or Carl, if you want to ask, but um... yeah, I'll 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 pick out one quickly. Um, so so Alexander asked, how do we analyze the difference in tube temperatures caused by furnace imbalance versus tube to port distance? So we we try to, as far as possible, know this before we do a fixed installation, and it's more difficult on a portable application. But let's take fixed installations. We try to analyze the 
uh, view of each camera before installation so that we know where the angle widens too much for there to be an accurate tube temperature measure, measurement to be taken from, just because you're seeing such a glancing edge of the tube. Um, so the distance is not so much of a factor. The infrared energy will travel um, a long distance uh, as long as that atmosphere is clean enough. So if there's heavy particulates in the atmosphere, of course, some of that infrared radiation will, will drop off. But we don't typically have a problem running at these process temperatures with um, with a loss of transmission. But we do have issues with the very wide angle uh, that is helped by a higher definition camera because we have that increased pixel resolution so we can see glancing edges with more pixels uh, but we we try as far as possible to model that before we uh before we go into a project any chance any ones you wanted to to take on tim there's a there's another question from um sharifi which i think i'll take offline and follow up by email about the the capex and uh, operating lives Mm -hmm. um, there was one question on we talked a little about a little bit earlier about low NOx burners used in the situations to counter the effects of excess higher excess oxygen levels. Um, low NOx burners are certainly an option for for um, reducing NOx emissions. Uh, really, what it comes down to it though is changing burners. If you don't already have a low NOx burner, can be a lot more work, more expensive compared to combustion optimization and low NOx burners are certainly well designed, but principles of, you know, these principles on combustion optimization in physics still apply to these burners. So just something to keep in mind. Um, there's also one other question about uh, would a proper flue gas monitoring include continuous monitoring of CO2, CO, oxygen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, NOx, hydrogen, Sulfur, CO2, I mean, uh, SO2, total hydrocarbon and, and moisture. And, and really, I wanted to speak to this one because that's a that's a lot of that's a lot of analytes. And really, I think it really comes down to what you're trying to accomplish from a combustion control standpoint. Combustion control benefits from flue gas monitoring uh, and flue gas monitoring being lower down in the process, not at the stack, not not at the furthest point, but really at combustion control at a lo lower point. Um, outside the radiant section. And so for the WG5 or other types of combustion analyzers, you only need a few measurements like excess oxygen, combustibles, and hydrocarbons for a, a, for a proper and actionable combustion control monitoring. Now, SO2, carbon dioxide, hydrogen are not going to be informative for safety margin or excess air at the burner. Now, that being said, those may be important for environmental reporting. Um, the other measurements like total hydrocarbon, SO2, water, moisture, uh, those might be more make more sense for reporting. But from a combustion control standpoint, it really comes down to those three measurements: of closer down in the closer down to the actual heater itself, um, so you can have actionable insight on the process. Um, any other uh, questions that you think? Uh, Carla, that we should talk through, or James, you think we should talk through? Uh, I I can take a couple offline. Um, in in terms sure. of install install base, yes, there's a there's a pretty pretty decent size install base in North America and globally. I can I can share that um, with uh, with you, uh, uh, Heidi. So I'll I'll follow up with you directly, and uh, that that's it from my side. Okay. All right. Well, we appreciate the questions. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Again, uh, if any thermal imaging related questions, relay them to James Cross. And uh, for any combustion optimization related questions, feel free to reach out to myself, Tim Talon, uh, at Amazon Cross Instruments. Um, and that being said, uh, thank you for attending, and we appreciate your time today. Uh, thanks for your help, James. I no, appreciate it, Tim. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody and uh, watch your inbox for the recording and information about on our upcoming webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.